Hello everyone. Always helps if I start the stream with myself on the screen. Sorry about that. How's everyone doing? Happy Friday, probably. I don't know. I've been one day ahead the whole week, so I think it's Friday. So happy Friday if you're watching live. Happy whatever day it is if you're watching a replay. Nice to see you all. Thank you for joining me. We are going to be going through the final couple of tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh. If you've not read, uh, not read, not watched the previous videos, they're all linked in the description below, so you can go and watch those at your leisure. Um, we are using Benjamin Foster's translation. It's got some handy dandy notes and interesting bits in the, the beginning. And at the end, there's like a whole criticism and response section. So you can read through that, get a feeling for what the academic community is saying about Gilgamesh. And yeah, we'll just, jump right in as ever if you have questions put them in the side chat please i will answer them at the end of each tablet and if you're not familiar with mesopotamian literature there are breaks this is not a complete text unfortunately so if there are breaks i will let you know and we'll just power through it together okay this is tablet 10. sidori the tavern keeper who dwelt at the edge of the sea dwelt there and kept a tavern. She had cup racks, she had vats of gold, she was covered with a veil. Gilgamesh strode toward her. He was clad in a skin, he was frightful. He had flesh of gods in his body, sorrow was in his heart, his face was like a traveller's from afar. The tavern keeper eyed him from a distance. Speaking to herself, she said these words, she debated with herself, This, I am sure, is a slaughterer. At the sight of him, the tavern keeper barred her door. She barred her door and went up to the roof terrace. But he, Gilgamesh, could hear her prattle. He looked straight up and fastened his eyes upon her. Gilgamesh said to her, the tavern keeper, Tavern keeper, when you saw me, why did you bar your door? Bar your door and go up to the roof terrace. I will strike down the door. I will shatter the door belt. The tavern keeper said to him, to Gilgamesh, the whole first section of all of these sentences is broken, but they end with, I barred my door, I went up to the roof terrace, I want to know. Presumably she's asking who he is and why he's there. Gilgamesh said to her, to the tavern keeper, I am he who, with my friend Enkidu, slew the guardian, who caught and slew the bull that came down from heaven, who... Excuse me, one moment, that's someone at my door. I will be right back. If you'd like an expert to answer your questions, then make sure you join us live next time. Check out digitalhammurabi.com forward slash calendar for details of future interviews. And remember to bring your questions. Sorry, uh, everyone, I have a delivery of, believe it or not, the very last of my stuff from the UK. I've been here nearly a decade and finally I've shipped my belongings over. Um, I'm going to just put this on hold as soon as the delivery guys have unloaded. I will be back. Um, I'm really sorry if you're watching this after. I'll cut this whole bit out so you won't even know. Um, but go make yourself a cup of tea. I will be back as soon as I can. Sorry about this.
and I'm back. Okay, sorry about that, everyone, but we are all done. Ooh. <coughs> and I saw that also we've had some slight audio issues at the beginning, so I'm just going to start again. Um, I will cut this out of the replay. So hi, if you've just joined us, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, I had a, deliver a delivery of some stuff from the UK. And I knew that they'd arrive as soon as uh, I started this live stream. So we're back. We're going to start with Tablet 10. Sidori the tavern keeper, who dwelt at the edge of the sea, dwelt there and kept a tavern. She had cup racks, she had vats of gold, she was covered with a veil. Gilgamesh strode toward her. He was clad in a skin, he was frightful. He had flesh of gods in his body, sorrow was in his heart, his face was like a traveller's from afar. The tavern keeper eyed him from a distance. Speaking to herself, she said these words. She debated with herself, This, I am sure, is a slaughterer of wild bulls. When's made he straight for my door? At the sight of him, the tavern keeper barred her door. She barred her door and went up to the roof terrace. But he, Gilgamesh, could hear her prattle. He looked straight up and fastened his eyes upon her. Gilgamesh said to her, to the tavern keeper, Tavern keeper, when you saw me, why did you bar your door? Bar your door and go up to the roof terrace. I will strike down the door. I will shatter the doorbell. We have some breaks. The tavern keeper said to him, to Gilgamesh, I barred my door. I went up to the roof terrace. I want to know. The first section of each of those sentences is broken, but I assume she's asking who he is and why he's there. Gilgamesh said to her, to the tavern keeper, I am he who, with my friend Enkidu, who slew the guardian, who caught and slew the bull that came down from heaven. Who felled Humbaba, who dwelt in the forest of cedars? Who killed lions at the mountain passes? The tavern keeper said to him, to Gilgamesh, If indeed you are he, who, with Enkidu, slew the guardian, who felled Humbaba, who dwelt in the forest of cedars, who killed lions at the mountain passes, who caught and slew the bull that came down from heaven, why are your cheeks eman emaciated, your face cast down, your spirits wretched, your features wasted? Sorrow in your heart, your face like a traveller's from afar, your features weathered by cold and sun. Why are you clad in a lion skin, roaming the steppe? Gilgamesh said to her, to the cat tavern keeper, Why should my cheeks not be emaciated, nor my face cast down, nor my spirit, excuse me, you're blocking the microphone, friend, nor my spirit, uh, uh, nor my spirit wretched, nor my features wasted. Why should there not be sorrow in my heart, nor my face like a traveller's from afar, nor my features weathered by cold and sun, nor I be clad in a lion skin roaming the steppe? My friend, swift wild donkey, mountain onager, panther of the steppe, Enkidu, swift wild donkey, mountain onager, panther of the steppe, my friend whom I so loved, who went with me through every hardship, Enkidu, whom I so loved, who went with me through every hardship. The fate of mankind has overtaken him. Six days and seven nights I wept for him. I would not give him up for funeral until a worm fell out of his nose. I was frightened. I have grown afraid of dying, so I roam the steppe. My friend's plight weighs heavy upon me. A distant road I roam over the steppe. My friend Enkidu's plight weighs heavy upon me. A distant road I roam over the steppe. How can I be silent? How can I hold my peace? My friend whom I love is turned to clay. Enkidu, my friend whom I love, is turned to clay. Shall I, not, shall I too not lie down like him and never get up forever and ever? After his death I could find no life. Back and forth I prowled like a bandit in the steppe. Now that I have seen your face, tavern keeper, may I not see that death I constantly fear. The tavern keeper said to him, to Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, wherefore do you wander? The eternal life you are seeking you shall not find. When the gods created ma death for mankind and withheld eternal life for themselves, uh, sorry, when gods created mankind, they established death, to death for mankind and withheld eternal life for themselves. 
As for you, Gilgamesh, let your stomach be full. Always be happy night and day. Make every day a delight. Night and day, play and dance. Your clothes should be clean. Your head should be washed. You should bathe in water. Look proudly on the little one holding your hand. Let your mate always be blissful in your loins. This, then, is the work of mankind. He who is alive should be happy. Gilgamesh said to her, the tavern keeper, What are you saying, tavern keeper? I am heartsick for my friend. What are you saying, tavern keeper? I am heartsick for Enkidu. Now then, what is the way to Utunapishtim? What is its landmark? Give it to me. Give, oh, give me its landmark. If need be, I'll cross the sea. If not, I'll roam the steppe. The tavern keeper said to him, to Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, there has never been a way across. No one from the dawn of time has ever crossed this sea. The valiant Shamash alone can cross the sea. Save for the sun, who could cross this sea? The crossing is perilous, highly perilous, the course, and midway lie the waters of death whose surface is impossible. Suppose, Gilgamesh, you do cross the sea. When you reach the waters of death, what will you do? Yet, Gilgamesh, there is Orshanabi, Utnapishtim's boatman. He has the stone charms with him as he picks cedar in the forest. Go, show yourself to him. If possible, cross with him. If not, turn back. When Gilgamesh heard this, he raised the axe at his side. He drew the sword from his belt. He crept forward, went down toward them. Like an arrow, he dropped among them. His battle cry resounded in the forest. When Orshanabi saw him, he put on his glory. He raised his own axe and stood up tall as he could before him. Then Gilgamesh, for his part, hit him on the pate, gripped him by the head, gripped his arm together with his chest, and the stone charms were those who sealed the boat from leaking. It was they that had no fear for the, water, the waters of death. The broad sea, the ocean, lapped toward Gilgamesh. He held back the stone charms and the boat from the water. He smashed the stone charms and threw them into a channel. Gilgamesh turned back and stood before him. Uh, Sorsanabi, which is another name for um, Orshanabi, stared at him. Sorsanabi said to him, to Gilgamesh, what is your name, pray tell? I am Sorsanabi, servant of Utnapishtim, the distant one. Gilgamesh said to him, to Sorsanabi, Gilgamesh is my name. I am he who came from Uruk, the abode of Anu, who travelled here around the mountains, the distant road where the sun comes forth. Now that I have seen your face, Sorsanabi, show me Utnapishtim, the distant one. Orshanabi said to him, to Gilgamesh, why are your cheeks emaciated, your face cast down, your spirit wretched, your features wasted, sorrow in your heart, your face like a traveller's from afar, your features weathered by cold and sun? Why are you clad in a lion's skin, roaming the steppe? Gilgamesh said to him, to Orshanabi, Why should my cheeks not be emaciated, nor my face cast down, nor my spirit wretched, nor my features wasted? Why should there not be sorrow in my heart, nor my face like a traveller's from afar, nor my features weathered by cold and sun, nor I be clad in a lion's skin roaming the steppe. My friend, swift wild donkey, mountain onager, panther of the steppe, Enkidu, swift wild donkey, mountain onager, panther of the steppe. My friend whom I so love, who went with me through every hardship, Enkidu, whom I so loved, who went with me through every hardship, the fate of mankind has overtaken him. Six days and seven nights I wept for him. I would not give him up for a burial until a worm fell out of his nose. I was frightened. I have grown af afraid of dying, so I roam the steppe. My friend's plight weighs heavy upon me. A distant road I roam over the steppe. My friend Enkidu's plight weighs heavy upon me. A distant road I roam over the steppe. How can I be silent? How can I hold my peace? My friend whom I loved is turned into clay. Enkidu, my friend whom I loved, is turned into clay. Shall I, too, not lie down like him, and never get up ever, forever and ever? Gilgamesh said to him, to Urshanabi, Now then, Urshanabi, what is the way to Utnapishtim? What is its landmark? Give it to me. Give, oh, give me its landmark. If need be, I'll cross the sea. If not, I'll roam the steppe. Urshanabi said to him, to Gilgamesh, 
Your own hands have foiled you, Gilgamesh. You have smas smashed the stone charms. You have thrown them into a channel. The stone charms are smashed and the cedar has not been picked. Stone charms, Gilgamesh, are what carry me, lest I touch the waters of death. In your fury you have smashed them. The stone charms, they are what I had to, uh, with me to make the crossing. Gilgamesh, raise the axe in your hand. Go into the forest. Cut me five times sixty poles, each five times twelve cubits long. Dress them, set, the, set on knobs. Bring them to me and load them to the boat. When Gilgamesh heard this, he raised the axe at his side. He drew the sword at his belt. He went down into the forest. He cut him five times sixty poles, each five times twelve cubits long. He dressed them, set on knobs. He brought them to him and loaded them on the boat. Gilgamesh and Oshanabi embarked on the boat. They launched the craft. It was they who manned it. A journey of a month and a half they made in three days. Oshanabi reached the waters of death at last. Oshanabi said to him, to Gilgamesh, Stand back, Gilgamesh, take first pole. Your hand must not touch the waters of death. You will do yourself in. Take the second, the third, the fourth pole, Gilgamesh. Take the fifth, sixth, and seventh pole, Gilgamesh. Take the eighth, ninth, and tenth pole, Gilgamesh. Take the eleventh and twelfth pole, Gilgamesh. At twice sixty sea miles, Gilgamesh had used up the poles. Then he, for his part, unfastened his, his belt. Gilgamesh tore off the clothes from his body, made a tall mast with his arms. Utnapishtim watched him from distance. Speaking to himself, he said these words. He debated with himself, Why have the stone charms belonging to the boat been smashed? and one not its master embarked thereon. He who comes here is no man of mine, but at his right my man, man is standing. I can see that he is no man of mine. I can see that he is no god. I can see that two-thirds of him is but divine, one-third is human. Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, Why are your cheeks emaciated, your face cast down? Your spirit wretched, your features wasted, sorrow in your heart, your features like a traveller's from afar, your features weathered like cold and sun. Why are you clad in a lion's skin roaming the steppe? Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim, Why should my cheeks not be emaciated, nor my face cast down, nor my spirit wretched, nor my features wasted? Why should there not be sorrow in my heart, nor my face like a traveller's from afar, nor my features weathered by cold and sun? nor I be clad in a lion's skin roaming the steppe. My friend, swift wild donkey, mountain onager, panther of the steppe. Enkidu, swift wild donkey, mountain onager, panther of the steppe. My friend whom I so loved, who went with me through every hardship. Enkidu, whom I so loved, who went with me through every hardship. The fate of mankind has overtaken him. Six days and seven nights I wept for him. I would not give him up for burial until a worm fell out of his nose. I was frightened. I have grown afraid of dying, so I roam the steppe. My friend's plight weighs heavy on me. A distant road I roam over the steppe. My friend Enkidu's plight weighs heavy upon me. A distant row my road I roam over the steppe. How can I be silent? How can I hold my peace? My friend whom I so loved is turned into clay. Enkidu, my friend whom I loved, is turned into clay. Shall I too not lie down like him, and never get up forever and ever? Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim, I said to myself, I will go see Utnapishtim, the distant one of whom they tell. I set forth, I traversed all lands. I came over one after another, wearisome mountains. Then I crossed one after another, all the seas. Too little sweet sleep has smoothed my countenance. I have worn myself out in sleeplessness. My muscles ache for misery. What have I gained for my trials? I had not reached the tavern keeper when my clothes were worn out. I killed bear, hyena, lion, panther, tiger, deer, ibex, wild beasts of the steppe. I ate their meat. I made a butchery of their skins. Let them close the gates of sorrow. Let them seal its portal tight with pitch and tar. Thanks to me, they shall never have to leave off dancing in their days. Thanks to me... Joyful, they shall spend their nights in bliss. Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, 
Why, O Gilgamesh, do you go in pursuit of sorrow? You who are formed of the flesh of gods and mankind, you for whom the gods acted like mother and father. When was it, Gilgamesh, you turned into a fool? They set a throne of you, they set a throne for you in the assembly of elders and said to you, Please take your seat. The fool is given beer dregs instead of butter, bran and crusts instead of something. The following is, is very fragmentary, unfortunately. You strive ceaselessly, what do you gain? When you wear out your strength in ceaseless striving, when you torture your limbs with pain, you hasten the end of your days. Mankind, whose descendants are snapped off like reeds in a cane break, the handsome young man, the lovely young woman, death will rob them of something all too soon. No one sees death, no one sees the face of death, no one hears the voice of death, but cruel death cuts off mankind. There is a time for building a house, there is a time for starting a family, there is a time for brothers to divide an inheritance, there is a time for disputes to prevail in this world. There is a time for the river, having risen and brought high water. Mayflies are drifting downstream on the river, their faces gazing at the sun. Then suddenly there is nothing. The missing and the dead, how alike they are. They lime not death's image. No, de uh, no one dead greets a living being in this world. The supreme gods, the great gods being convened, the goddess mother Mamitum, she who created their own destiny, ordained with them. They established death and life. The time of death they did not make known. That is tablet 10. I'm going to take a quick look and see if we have any questions. Poor old Gilgamesh. He's not having an easy time of it. Um, Nun Bell ever asking if this was supposed to be sung. Quite possibly, I don't actually know enough about performance of literature in um, Mesopotamia to know, and obviously it would have varied by time and place, um, but I would not be surprised at all. Do, 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 sorry. Josh joining in the chat. Thank you, friend. <laughs> Got to love a good... Uh, a bit of sexual innuendo with your Gilgamesh. Okay, I think we can move on. Ah, Alan, yes, like all good heroes, he's his own worst enemy. He really is. He really is. But we love him. Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim, the distant one, As I look upon you, Utnapishtim, your limbs are not different. You are just as I am. Indeed, you are not different at all. You are just as I am. My mind was made up to do battle with you, but now in your presence my arm is stayed. You then, how did you join the ranks of the gods and find eternal life? Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, I will reveal to you, O Gilgamesh, a secret matter, and a mystery of the gods I will tell you. The city Shurupak, a city you yourself have knowledge of, which once was set on the bank of the Euphrates, that same city was ancient, and gods once were within it. The great gods resolved to send the deluge. Their father Anu was sworn, their counsellor the valiant Enlil, the throne-bearer Ninorta, their canal officer Anugi, their leader Ea was sworn with them. He repeated their plans to the reed fence. Reed fence, reed fence. Wall, wall, listen, O reed fence, pay attention, O wall. O man of Shurupak, son of Ubatutu, wreck house, build boat, forsake possessions and seek life, belongings reject and life save. Take aboard the boat, seed of all living things. The boat you shall build, let her dimensions be measured out, let her width and length be equal, roof her over like the watery depths. I understood full well. I said to Ea, my lord, your command, my lord, exactly as you said it, I shall faithfully execute. What shall I answer the city, the populace, and the elders? Ea made ready to speak, saying to me, his servant, then you shall speak to them thus. I am sure that Enlil has come to dislike me. I shall not dwell in your city. I shall not even set my foot on the dry land of Enlil. I shall descend to the watery depths and dwell with my lord Ea. 
Upon you he shall shower down in abundance, a windfall of birds, a surprise of fishes. He shall pour upon you a harvest of riches, in the, in the morning cakes in spates, in the afternoon grains in rains. At the first glimmer of dawn, the land was assembling at the gate of Atrahasis. The carpenter carried his adze, the reed cutter carried his stone, the shipwright carried his broad, broad axe, the old men brought the coiled palm fibre, the wealthy carried pitch. In five days I planked her hull, one full acre was her deck space, ten dozen cubits the height of each of her sides, ten dozen cubits square her outer dimensions. I laid out her structure, I planned her design. I decked her in six, I divided her in seven. Her interior I divided in nine. I drove the water plugs into her. I saw to the spars and laid in the stores. Thrice thirty-six hundred measures of tar I poured into the oven. Thrice thirty-six hundred measures of tar I poured out inside her. Not counting the thirty-six hundred measures of oil that the offering consumed, and twice thirty-six hundred measures of oil that the boat builder heard it held in reserve. Draw a plan of the boat that you will build, a plan of a circle. Let her length and breadth be equal. Let her deck area be one acre. Let her sides be ten cubits high. Let thongs, each a hundred and twenty cubits long, be interwoven inside her. Let my household twist the palm fibre for you. It will surely take four times three hundred and three thousand six hundred plus thirty measures of fibre. I lay out thirty ribs within her, ten times ten cubits long, twenty fingers thick. I fastened three thousand six hundred six hundred staunchions within her, ten fingers thick, half cubit long. I walled in her compartments above and below. I allowed sixty times sixty measures of bitumen for her outside. I allowed sixty times sixty measures of bitumen for her inside. I had sixty times sixty measures of bitumen poured out for her compartments. I had my kilns loaded with 28,800 measures of tar. Then I poured out 3,600 measures of bitumen into her. The bitumen did not come all the way up. Fifty times sixty measures of lard I added. For the workmen I slaughtered bullocks. I killed sheep upon sheep every day. Beer, ale, oil and, and wine. I poured out for the workers like river water. They were feasting as if it were New Year. One sunrise I set my hand to coating her outside with oil. By sunset the boat was completed. We kept moving the rollers up and down until two-thirds of her was coated. Whatever I had I loaded upon her. What silver I had I loaded upon her. What gold I had I loaded upon her. I sent up on board all my family and kin, beasts of the steppe, wild animals of the steppe, all types of skilled craftsmen I set up on board. As for the wild animals of the steppe, two by two they went up into the boat. We've got some broken bits, but it describes uh, taking plants and grain for the animals to eat. Shamash set for me the appointed time. In the morning, cakes in spates. In the evening, grains in rains. Go into your boat and seal the door from leaking. That appointed time came. In the morning, cakes in spates. In the evening, grains in rains. I gazed upon the face of the storm. The weather was dreadful to behold. I went into the boat and sealed the door from leaking. To the one who sealed the boat from leaking, to Puzor Enlil the boatman, I gave over the edifice with all it contained. At the first glimmer of dawn, a black cloud rose over the horizon. Inside it, Adad was thundering, while the destroying gods Shulat and Hanish went in front, advancing as his throne bearers over hill and plain. Arakal was tearing out the mooring posts of the world. Ninorta, as he went, made the dikes overflow. The supreme gods held torches aloft, setting the land ablaze with their glow. Adad's awesome power passed over the heavens. Whatever was bright was turned into gloom. He charged over the land like an ox. He smashed it like a clay pot. For one day the storm wind blew. Swiftly it blew. The flood came forth. The onslaught passed over the people like a battle. No one could see the one next to him. People could not recognize each other in the downpour. The gods became frightened of the deluge. They shrank back, went up to Anu's highest heaven. The gods...
when I was one to speak up for an evil deed in the assembly of the gods? How could I have spoken up for an evil deed in the assembly of the gods and spoken up for an attack to destroy my people? It is I who bring them into the world. They are my people. Now, like so many fish, they choke up the sea. The supreme gods were weeping with her. In tearful sorrow, they were weeping with her. Their lips were parched, taking on a feverish warmth. Six days and seven nights, the wind continued. The flood and windstorm leveled the land. When the six, seventh day arrived, the windstorm abated, that flood abated in battle. The sea that had churned like a woman in labor grew calm. The tempest stilled, the deluge ceased. I looked at the weather, stillness ranged, uh, stillness reigned, and the whole human race had turned into clay. The landscape was flat as a rooftop. I opened my hatch, sunlight fell upon my face. Falling to my knees, I sat down, weeping, tears streaming down my face. I looked at the edge of the world, the borders of the sea. At fourteen places a point of land arose. The boat had come to rest on Mount Nemush. Mount Nemush hold the boat fast, not letting it move. One day, a second day, Mount Nemush held the boat fast, not letting it move. A third day, a fourth day, Mount Nemush hold the boat fast not letting it move. A fifth day, a sixth day, Mount Nemush held the boat fast, not letting it move. When the seventh day arrived, I brought out a dove and set it free. The dove soared off in search of food. No landing place appeared to it, so it came back. I brought out a swallow and set it free. The swallow soared off in search of food, and no landing place appeared to it, so it came back. I brought out a raven and set it free. The raven soared off and sawed the ebbing of the waters. It ate, scratched, and bobbed its head, so it did not come back. I brought out an offering and offered it to the four directions. I set up an incense offering on the summit of the mountain. I arranged seven and seven cult vessels. I heaped reeds, cedar, and myrtle in their bowls. The gods smelled the savour. The gods smelled the sweet savour. The gods crowded around the sacrifice like flies. As soon as Bella Illy arrived, she held up the great fly ornaments that Anu had made for her in his ardor. O oh gods, these shall be my lapis necklace, lest I forget. I shall be mindful of these days and not forget, not ever. The gods should come to the incense offering, but Enlil should not come to the incense offering, because he brought the flood without thinking and marked my people for destruction. As soon as Enlil arrived, he, Enlil saw the boat and flew into a rage. He was filled with fury at the gods. From where has a living creature escaped? No man was to survive destruction. Ninorta made ready to speak, saying to the valiant Enlil, Who but Ea could contrive such a thing? For Ea alone knows every artifice. Enlil made ready to speak, oh, Ea made ready to speak, saying to the valiant Enlil, You, O oh valiant one, the wisest of the gods, how could you have brought on the flood without thinking? Punish the wrongdoer for his wrongdoing. Punish the transgressor for his transgression. Ease up for no snap. Pull tight for no slack. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let the lion strike to diminish the human race. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let the wolf strike to diminish the human race. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let famine strike to wreak havoc in the land. Instead of your bringing on a flood, let pestilence strike to wreak havoc in the land. It was not I who told the secret of the great gods. I let Archlehasis have a dream, and so he heard the secret of the gods. Now then, think what to do about him. Then Enlil came up into the boat. Leading me by my hands, he brought me out. He brought out my wife, had her kneel beside me. He touched our brows, stood between us to bless us. Hitherto Utnapishtim has been a human being. Now Utnapishtim and his wife shall become like us gods. Utnapishtim shall dwell far distant at the mouth of the rivers. Thus it was they took me to a far distant and had me dwell at the mouth of the rivers. Now then, who will convene the great gods for your sake, that you may find the eternal life you sleep, uh, you seek? Come now, try not to sleep for six days and seven nights. As he sat there on his haunches, sleep was swelling over him like a mist. 
Utnapishtim said to her, to his wife, Behold this fellow who wanted eternal life. Sleep swells over him like a mist. His wife said to him, to Utnapishtim, the distant one, Do touch him so the man wakes up. Let him return safe on the way whence he came. By the portal he came through, let him return to his land. Utnapishtim said to her, to his wife, Since the human race is duplicitous, he'll endeavor to dupe you. Come now, bake his daily loaves, put them one after another by his head, then mark the wall for each day he has slept. She baked his daily loaves for him, put one after another by his head, and made known for him on the wall the days he had slept. The first loaf was dried hard, the second was leathery, the third soggy, the crust of the fourth had turned white, the fifth was grey with mould, the sixth was fresh, the seventh was still on the coals when he touched him. The man woke up. Gilgamesh said to him, to Utnapishtim, the distant one, Scarcely had sleep stolen over me when straight away you touched me and roused me. Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, Up with you, Gilgamesh. Count for me your daily loaves, that the days you have slept may be known to you. The first loaf is dried hard. The, third is, the second is leathery, the third soggy. The crust of the fourth has turned white. The fifth is grey with mould, the sixth is fresh, the seventh was still on the coals when I touched you and you woke up. Gilgamesh said to him, to Urshanabi, uh, to Utnapishtim, the distant one, How should I carry on, Utnapishtim? Wherever should I go, now that the bereaver has taken hold of my flesh? Death lurks in my bedchamber, and wherever I turn, there is death. Utnapishtim said to him, to Urshanabi, the boatman, Oshanabi, may the harbour cast you off, may the crossing despise you, be banished from the shore you shuttle to. The man you brought here, his body is matted with filthy hair, hides have marred the beauty of his flesh. Take him in hand, Oshanabi, bring him the washing bowl, have him cut out his filthy hair with water, clean as clean, oh, have him wash out his filthy hair with water, clean as clean can be. Have him throw away his hides, let the sea carry them off. Let his fine body be rinsed clean. Let his headband be new. Have him put on raiment worthy of his dignity. Until he reaches his city, until he completes his journey, let his raiment stay spotless, fresh and new. Orshanabi took him in hand and brought him to the washing bowl. He washed out his filthy hair with water, clean as clean can be. He threw away his hides, the sea carried him off. His fine hair, his fine body was rinsed clean. He renewed his headband, put on raiment worthy of his dignity, until he reached his city, until he completed his journey. The raiment would stay spotless, fresh and new. Gilgamesh and Orshanabi embarked on the boat. They launched the craft, it was they who, man who manned it. His wife said to him, to Utnapishtim, the distant one, Gilgamesh has come here, spent with exertion. What have you given him for his homeward journey? At that, he, Gilgamesh, lifted the pole, bringing the boat back to the shore. Utnapishtim said to him, to Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, you have come here, spent with exertion. What have I given you for your homeward journey? I will reveal to you, O Gilgamesh, a secret matter and a mystery of the gods I will tell you. There is a certain plant. Its shape is like a thorn bush. Its thorns are like the wild rose and will prick your hand. If you can secure this plant, when you eat it, you will return to how you were in your youth. No sooner had Gilgamesh heard this, he opened a shaft, threw away his tools. He tied heavy stones to his feet, they pulled him down into the watery depths. He took hold of the plant and pulled it up. It pricked his hand, he cut the heavy stones from his feet, and the sea cast him upon its shore. Gilgamesh said to him, to Orshanabi the boatman, Orshanabi, this plant is cure for heartache whereby a man can regain his vitality. I will take it to ramparted Uruk. I will have an old man eat some and so test the plant. His name shall be Old Man Has Become Young Again. I myself will eat it and return to how I was in my youth. At twenty double leagues they took a bite to eat. At thirty double leagues they made their camp. Gilgamesh saw a pond whose water was cool. He went down, to bathe in, uh, he went down into it to bathe in the water. A snake caught the scent of the plant. Stealthily it came up and carried the plant away. On its way back it shed its skin.
Thereupon Gilgamesh sat down weeping, tears streaming down his face. He said to Oshanabi the boatman, For whom, Oshanabi, have my arms been toiling? For whom has my heart's blood been poured out? For myself I have obtained no benefit. I have done a good deed for a reptile. Now the flood waters rise against me for twenty double leagues. When I opened the shaft, I threw away the tools. How shall I find my bearings? Had I only turned away and left the boat on the shore? At twenty double leagues, they took a bite to eat. At thirty double leagues, they made their camp. When they arrived in ramparted Uruk, Gilgamesh said to him, to Urshanabi the boatman, Go up, Urshanabi, pace out the walls of Uruk. Study the foundation terrace and examine the brickwork. Is not its masonry of kiln-fired brick? And did not seven masters lay its foundations? One square mile of city, one square mile of gardens, one square mile of clay pits, a half square mile of Ishtar's dwelling. Three and a half square miles is the measure of Uruk. That is the end of the Gilgamesh epic. It ends pretty much as it started, gazing out at the city of Uruk. Well, I enjoyed that. I hope you all did too. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a look and see if we have questions. Excuse me. Um, Nunbel ever is the Sumerian, oh, how, what is the equal you know, Sumerian cubits and how many biblical cubits? I think it's the same measurement. It, it's your middle finger all the way to your elbow, I think. Measurements are not my strong point, but I, I believe it's the same. Um, 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 um. Uh, Luru, could it be possible to build a real boat according to this description? Is it a kind of knowledge or more fantasy? Um, if you... Uh, go on YouTube and look for Irving Finkel, um, Noah's Ark. He did, uh, Dr. Irving Finkel is one of the curators at the British Museum. He did a um, a film where he did actually make a smaller scale, um, but make a boat in the style that is being described here. This is a very traditional Mesopotamian boat, round, made of reeds covered in bitumen um, to waterproof it. But yeah. It's absolutely doable. Doable. Uh, Sadakus, I understand it's sci-fi. Has anyone read Zachariah Sitchin or is that allowed here? It's absolutely allowed. Uh, I've read the first book. Um, I didn't really get into it more than that. It's very interesting sci-fi. Um, we have a couple of videos talking about why it's not actually historical. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. We get asked occasionally if Zachariah Sitchin could read Sumerian. My answer is I don't know. If he could, he was straight up lying or just didn't understand it as well as he wants people um, think uh, wants people to think he was. Um, Sitchin, uh, sorry, I wouldn't call him revolutionary. He made a bunch of shit up. Um, his translations are straight out incorrect. He doesn't didn't understand Sumerian as well as he thought he did. And again, the field has come a long way since he was writing. Um, I should just do a basic video walking through some of the mistakes he makes in translation because, um, yeah, it's it's none of it, I'm afraid, is rooted in, in historical, archaeological... Uh, uh, sorry, my brain is not... I'm looking for a word. Study of ancient languages. Philological. Philological fact. Uh, I am not familiar with that song. I version of Archhasa Zanenki, that sounds pretty damn cool. If there is a, a link somewhere you can send me, I, I'll put it in the description. Uh, that sounds fascinating. Um, 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 sorry, just scrolling down. Sorry. Uh, so this isn't a question, but I do want to comment of it. Um, Alan is saying that Genesis ripped off this story so hard, even the Garden of Eden story, not just the flood. Uh, yep, a lot of, of the biblical material is very heavily connected to what we see in Mesopotamian literature. Um, I have a couple of videos about 
specifically the flood narrative in Mesopotamia and uh, the biblical account. Uh, it's not plagiarism. If you say plagiarism, I will throw something at you. Just fair warning. And it's not plagiarism because of many reasons, and I'm not going to go on that particular run here, but how the biblical authors reused and reworked specifically this um, story is actually really interesting because they take um, what is a story of the capriciousness of Mesopotamian gods and their desire to kill all of humanity. It, it goes into more detail in, in other myths in, in Atrasis, um, their desire to kill humanity essentially because they can't sleep. It takes that story and flips it on his head and uses it to show the power and the mercy of Yahweh, which is very, it's very interesting. I, yeah, I, I enjoy how that was done. Um, I'll try and find my video and link it for you. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just scrolling down to try and see if we have more questions. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Alan again, Tablet 1 explicitly tells us that this is a written story. Gilgamesh doesn't defeat death, but the device of writing wins him in immortality of a sort. Might that have impressed an ancient audience? Um, yeah, quite possibly. I mean, this is something that you see with a lot of um, royal writings, writings commissioned by kings on behalf of kings. It's what I started my PhD dissertation on. Um, royal inscriptions and a lot of them are expressly for using writing to preserve your own name the idea is that you you make a name for yourself and you write it down and then it's it's kept there and there are actually curses in a lot of these inscriptions that essentially say because they, they were buried underneath um, temple foundations and put in temple walls and palace walls and all this kind of thing so it's not like they would have been very publicly accessible. These were not intended to um, necessarily publicize your name to the populace. Who the audience is, is can be debated. I think it was the gods and uh, future kings, but there are curses that say if uh, like, like curses on future kings who dig up these inscriptions and don't put them back again or erase the names off and, and put their own names on them instead. Um, the preservation of one's name, I think, in writing explicitly is is very, very important to um, a lot of Mesopotamian kings. Uh, Hussein is saying there are a lot of people interested about our civilization. Absolutely. I love Mesopotamia. I feel greatly privileged to have been able to spend so much of my life studying it. I would love to visit Iraq one day. Um, one day. We will see. Okay, I'm just checking to see if we have... Do, do, do. Sorry. I want to make sure I don't miss any questions before I say goodbye. Yes, I love the biblical parallels, of course, but what really sings to me is Gilgamesh's love for Enkidu and his deep pain upon his death. Absolutely, this is this is a story of of grief, grief and mortality, and I think a very human um very human fear of death. Like it, it's a thing. I think a lot of people, if not everyone, struggles with it. And this is, this is Gilgamesh's attempt to come to terms with his own mortality. And it, it, it speaks to a lot of people. Uh, Zaya, uh, if you have something to email me, like I, I asked Zaya to please send me the link to their video. Um, just email me digitalhammerabi at gmail .com and I will. I'll put it in the, uh, in the description. Do do do. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh dear, apparently Josh is home and I've locked him out. Okay, well, this is a great time for me to go then and let him into the house. I, Sorry, darling, I'll be right there. Thank you everyone for joining me. I really enjoyed this. I hope that you did too. Um, I think I'm, I'll probably start making this a regular thing. I really enjoy reading Mesopotamian literature. I have books and books of it downstairs. So I'll be back in the new year with some new stories for you. If you have a particular favorite that you want me to tackle first, leave a comment in the description and I will see what I can do. If you celebrate Christmas, have a lovely Christmas. If you don't celebrate it, I hope you have a lovely time regardless. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon.
Digital Hammurabi is made possible by generous sponsorship from our patrons. Their support means that we have the technological and academic resources necessary to bring the ancient world directly to you. If you want to join the team, go to patreon.com forward slash digital Hammurabi to see how you can help.